It's over 36 years since the Irish Republican Army bombed Conservative Party conference in Brighton. One of those killed in the attack was Sir Anthony Berry. And today I'm interviewing his daughter, an extraordinary woman named Jo Berry. Now, Jo Berry responded to the killing of her father by looking for reconciliation and forgiveness and how she could use her experience to look at other conflicts to push for reconciliation and peace. And she established a truly extraordinary friendship with Patrick McGee, who I've already interviewed, who killed her father. And they've been friends and worked together now for two decades. I think that's an extraordinary story. And I want to talk to her about the emotional journey that she's been on, about the impact on her losing her dad in such horrific circumstances. I want to talk to her about how she went looking for peace and reconciliation, about her building Bridges for Peace organization, which she founded. And I want to talk to her about how she met Patrick McGee, what that was like, and what she has learned from the friendship she established and what we can all learn from that friendship. It's a very powerful interview, uh, and I hope you take the time to watch the whole thing. Joe, it's a huge honour, really big honour to be able to speak to you. Oh, thank you. It's, it's an absolute honour for me to be speaking to you. Thank you so much for asking me. No, no. I mean, it's when when I knew, I was told you were you were willing to chat. I was, I was, I was over the moon. So I just want to start. Let's just chat about your your dad first. Your dad died in the mm -hmm. 1980, uh, 1984 Brighton bombing. You were twenty seven years old. Just tell tell me about about your dad, the man you knew him as a father, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Oh, my dad was a very much a family man. He had six children, he adored us all, he'd do anything for us. And for him, he was really driven by caring, by, by love, by concern. I have so many memories of going to Southgate where he was Member of Parliament and we'd get out of the car and walk where we were going and people would stop him and ask him questions, ask him for help. And I remember watching him and realising that he was there to help you know, absolutely everyone. And he was that kind of MP. Um, he could just walk around anywhere and people would recognise him. He was very tall and would come to him. And, and we were really close. Uh, we had some amazing conversations that last year. And even though I was young, I was, I was just 27 when he was killed, I'd reached a place in, in me where we were, we'd moved from father-daughter to being really good friends. And... He had, he had great understanding of, of me and what I wanted from life, which was not necessarily a kind of conventional way. When you heard there'd been a bombing at Conservative Party conference at Brighton, and then you found out your dad had, had been killed in that bombing, mm -hmm. just, tell, just talk me through what that was like, what went through your head. No, oh, we had to wait for a very, very long time before they found his body. And the shock arrived, you know, as soon as I heard a bomb had gone off at the Grand Hotel. Um, and as soon as I heard that he was dead, um, me and my sister had to go and pick up a younger brother and sister and tell them that their dad was dead and they were in their teens. And I remember straight away, just the shock and the denial this was happening. And then a sense that I'd also lost part of me in that bomb. I couldn't go back to the person I had been because now I feel like I'm part of a war. I'm part of a violent conflict. I no longer live in peacetime. Um, and that, that was like hugely challenging. And the next couple of days, as well as the grief and the shock and and feeling like I no longer was part of what everyone else was going through, I had had the sense that I was in a war. Many of us have lost a dad, but not in those circumstances. And I've, it's, you know, mm -hmm. it's very hard to imagine what that's like. I mean, in those first few days, did it take, did it not sink in? Was it something which just seemed so unimaginable? 
I mean, that this would happen to to your to your father, given you felt you were at peacetime, and that's a really important point. The idea yeah. that anything like this could happen would never really have crossed your head, I, I doubt. So what... no, no. I mean, even though the IRA, um, there, you know, there were bombs going off as a teenager in London, but I I felt safe. I know lots of people who di who didn't live with that safety, you know. So I'm very grateful I had that till I was 27. So yeah, the next few days um, was very very intense, and it was very public. That's the thing about t um, terrorist attacks. Um, you know, it's in the news that you're being reminded all the time. And I, two days later, went somewhere in London that meant a lot to me. St. James's Church at that time was a very sort of alternative place where everyone was welcome. And I sat in the church and decided that maybe there was a choice to make. Do I have an enemy? Do I have the right to go for revenge? Is this going to mean that the person I had been doesn't exist anymore and I have to give up on everything I dreamt of or do I find a way to understand those who kill my dad because I never wanted an enemy and I did and from that moment there was a journey to go on and I vowed to bring something positive out of it so that was just two days later and as soon as I made that vow I kind of knew that somehow I was going to survive I was going to be okay One of the other things which obviously many people have lost relatives, but nothing like in those circumstances, is it's all over the news. It's all over the newspapers. It's been discussed on television. Did that make it harder? Oh, definitely. Yeah. You know, there's, there's no been no getting away with it. Um, in, even now at any moment, you know, the Brighton bomb can come on the news. I mean, not so much anymore, but certainly the first 20 years. Um, so it did make it harder. You know, and the newspapers uh, were very much seeing it as sort of the most sort of evil act that had ever happened, and that sort of didn't help me. And I remember when, when Patrick McGee was um, imprisoned, it was about a couple of years later, I didn't even go to the court. I just couldn't even hear about it. And at that time, there was no support offered to anyone affected by terrorism. And even now it's it's hard. I'm actually working to make sure there is more support for victims of terrorism because it's a unique experience, different from others, because it keeps on coming back in every anniversary. Anytime another attack happens, we're all reminded. And because I didn't have any support emotionally, I think that delayed um, my own healing and, and transformation. You spoke about how it felt you in peacetime and then all of a sudden, of course, your, your dad's killed in a terrorist attack, you in wartime. Mm. The IRA's justification is, or not just well, rationale, I suppose, in as detailed in, in Patrick McGee's book is that the British government, their strategy was containing conflict within the north of Ireland and that this wasn't appearing anymore in newspapers, on TV, and this was a way of bringing the war uh, front and centre so it couldn't be ignored by the British government. When you, What's your response to that whole rationale, in, as, as explained in the book, which, of course, you wrote it forward for, so you, 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 I'm sure you read it far more thoroughly than me, but what, what's your emotional response when you read that, those words? Mm, yeah, that's a, a really hard question. And maybe, you know, it's a good time to say that I've, spent the last 20 years in dialogue with Patrick McGee. And so I've heard many, many parts of his story over the years. I've heard what he saw in his community, which then led him to join the IRA. Now, I am passionate about nonviolence, and I don't believe violence ever works because the legacy of even one person being hurt is too great. And I think there's the healing that has to happen, you know, is not worth it. That obviously is very, very different from, from Patrick's position, where he believes violence um, sometimes is necessary and works. I have, however, understood the roots of violence by listening to his story. And for me, it's about empathy. You know, I have my position, I'm very, very clear about that. But I can understand because of what he experienced he came to that conclusion that needing to join the IRA was his only choice. Now, what interests me is how can we 
create a world where people at 16, 17, 18 know their other choices to using violence. You know, he, at 14, he was interested in non-violence. He was reading about Martin Luther King, you know, and then something changed. What else could have happened? What's the intervention that could have happened? And I feel that's um, a shared responsibility. Like the government has some responsibility in that. Could they have do, done more? Now we can't change the past, but are there lessons on moving forward? You know, are there ways where the people who eventually came around that table and the Good Friday Agreement, could they have all happened? Could it have happened earlier? And my belief is that dialogue, and this is where Patrick would agree with me, you know, dialogue and listening, you know, has to happen like always first. Well, always in my in my perspective. Before I ask you about when you first met Pat McGee in 2000, not long after he was released under the terms of the Good Friday Agreement, mm -hmm. no one would begrudge a response which was angry or vengeful. That's how many people naturally feel after something like this happens. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to think of the person responsible as anything else other than a monster. I'm just wondering, I mean... I mean, we don't have to talk, you know, too much detail in terms of family or whatever. But I mean, did you, you know, were people when you when you you said early on after the attack that was your natural response? What was the reaction of people around you to that? Uh, to not have that those feelings, to think to yourself, I don't want vengeance. How did people were people surprised? Were they taken aback? Yes, um, they were. I am. I did a very small article on the Evening Standard in, in 86, and I got death threats at that time. And I was thinking it's very hard for people to understand that the stance I was taking was about not changing the past, but changing the future. And over the years, I've had people accuse me of all sorts of things from betraying my father and uh, I'm a traitor. So the way I answer that is so if, if I speak to someone and they're really angry with me and they the thing what I've done is wrong, then I'll listen to them. And I I expect that they've got a really good reason for thinking that. They've got their own story of hurt. Maybe they've never had justice. So I'll move then into listening to them. And I'm not everything I've done is not about being liked, it's about experiment. You know, if we can find different ways of communicating without hurting each other, you know, if we can listen to people who've who've really hurt us in a way which is respecting both. Now, what else can can we do? And so I've been learning so much about taking this stance. And if I had seen Patrick McGee as a monster, then that would have affected my own humanity. You know, I, I wouldn't be the person I am now. And the reason why I went to see him was not to get an apology, not to change him, but to see him as a human being. And if I could humanise him, because like the media were never going to give me the... Um, the human being were never going to give me his story because he was seen as a monster. And I wanted to look into his eyes and just see some of his humanity. And that would help me. And it did help me. Can I just be clear, the, the death threats you got, who who sent you death threats? Oh God, I can't, can't remember. I've had quite a few. So it would be from people who uh, were very, very angry because they'd lost loved ones in different ways. Uh, um, yeah. It, it was... Not so much recently, it was back in back in the 80s when I first went public. In, when I was in my 20s, I would talk about forgiveness, and now I find it quite a hard word. So I would say, I think in the evening stand, I said, I've forgiven them. can't remember if we knew who it was then who'd killed my dad, but you know, I've forgiven them. And, and yeah, people find that really, really hard. I wish I understand. I mean, if people are angry with you because... You know, your response is to your father's death is your own. It's a legitimate, you know, the fact people didn't see it as a legitimate response. How did that, how did, how did that make you feel? Um, it actually makes me aware that they must be hurting and struggling. You know, the people who find what I've done difficult and challenging, you know, I'm, I'm not in this to go, I'm right and you're wrong. It's not what this is about. You know, if someone has a very strong opinion, I'm curious what's the story behind that. You know, as long as they're not being abusive to me, and obviously anyone wants to 
give me a death threat, I'm not going to go into conversation at that point. But as you know, as long as they're being respectful, then they have their reasons, you know. And I think healing after any kind of death, whether it's um, by you know homicide or murder or terrorism or or whatever, you know, it's going to take a long, long time to heal. And we're all at different perspective points. We're all doing different ways. So I'm never going to judge someone who thinks what I've done is wrong. I'm really looking at how we can go beyond that arguing. You know, I have no need to prove to anyone I, I'm right at all anymore. I'm far more interested in in listening and hearing and 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 empathy. The official position of the British government um, was that we don't negotiate with terrorists. Um, but as we now know, actually, dialogue mm. routes were actually open secretly. Mm. But when but when that official position was expounded, what what were your thoughts at the time? Uh, well, I, I don't know when they, you probably know more than I do, when they actually started um, negotiating. But I just wish it happened sooner. It could have saved you know, thousands of lives. So. People have, I spend a lot of time in, in North of Ireland and there's so much trauma there and pain which has not been addressed yet. And then it gets passed down to the next generation. So the sooner they've been negotiating, then you know, the less harm it would have caused. Before the, the killing of your father and the, and the attack on, on the hotel, did you know much about the conflict? In Ireland, and how much did you then go on a on a on a journey to try and understand what was happening, and what were the conclusions you drew from doing that? Um, yeah, I was, I was very aware of it. Um, as I say, as a teenager, bombs were going off; it was on the news every day, and I just wanted it all to stop. Um, but when I was slightly older, I remember that was in my twenties, the hunger strikers, and not agreeing with the government's position on, on that. Um, and I'm sure that Mrs Thatcher's decision to not give in to their needs probably led to um, the government being targeted. Um, but I felt very detached, you know, I, I was not an activist in those days. My position was more about inner peace and uh, I spent a lot of time in the Himalayas and I was reading about Gandhi and the Tibetan way of non-violence but I felt very outside what was happening and of course that changed and I traveled to Belfast in in 85 and 86 and I met so many people there amazing people who opened up to me and shared their stories of what it was like to live there with the British soldiers on the streets and and I'm not someone who learns from you know history books I learn very much from hearing people's emotions and feelings and that sort of human connection. So that was a, an incredible time of just beginning to humanise the other. And then in 2000, I met other men who'd been in the IRA and some of them had been involved in the hunger strike. Some of them were part of the blanket protests and spent quite a, well, I spent a whole weekend with them. And that also helped me because I'm sort of feeling kind of person. It was more, what did it feel like to be around people who would have supported the decision um, of, the, the bomb which killed my father and just being around them was a big preparation for meeting Patrick McGee. And before before I just come directly on to Patrick McGee, I mean, did you think, obviously in no sense, obviously opposing all forms of, of, of violence, did you come to a sense of, because obviously to understand is not to legitimise, to understand is not mm. to, to condone and so on. And often it's difficult to have those conversations because even mm. simply understanding a unpleasant phenomenon is seen as somehow legitimising it. And that's just not, not the case. But did you yeah. did you come to an understanding where you, you understood why mm. so many young men became involved in, in the Republican armed struggle, for example? Uh, yeah, I did during the year 2000. Uh... I met so many people. Um, I think once the peace process was there, there were so many opportunities to go into workshops and we'd have weekend residentials where people would arrive from all different positions of those that had been involved in the armed um, struggle, those that had been victims, and even ex-British soldiers were there, and it was all completely confidential. Um, and those extraordinary 
meetings and people who would have been former enemies sitting together, laughing, talking, you know, people connected through, through the fact that everybody had been through so much and through storytelling in a very safe way, you know, people began to understand. And for me, that was absolute eye opener of understanding that when we really listen to someone's story, you know, there is no sides. You know, we all could have been each other depending on where we grew up. And that gave me such a sense of how I'd like the world to be, you know. I mean, and what what a absolute on a tragedy that these people who would have been hating each other and hurting can in fact sit down together. And how can we have those conversations before violence is ever used? So it was an amazingly transform transformative time uh, by just meeting people from you know, all different sides. And I met the, some of the women from the, who stayed aligned to nonviolence all, all through the time as well. I just immersed myself in all the different stories and, and I have ever since. Before you met Patrick McGee and you knew you were gonna meet him, what was going through your head? I was actually terrified. So I tried to make the, create the meeting in the year 2000 a few times and just kept on being told he didn't want to meet me. And and then when I eventually got the news, I was off to Glen Cree Recreation Centre, which is like my, it was kind of my sanctuary, my where I went to meet other people and it was very supportive. And and I remember that, that morning I got a phone call from an amazing friend, Anne Gallagher, who's sadly not with us, saying that Patrick would be at our house that evening. And my first thought was, oh, not today, I'm not, I'm not in the mood. <laughs> I was leaving my little daughters and just felt very mundane. And that, But then I thought, how could this feel okay? This is huge. So I, I said yes, and, and off I went on the ferry between Holyhead and Dublin. Just just terrified, you know, would I, like I have felt anger and rage, but would that be there? You know, how would I feel? Would I regret it? No, no one knew I was doing this. And this, this was a, at that time, completely private and personal. It was something I needed to do for me. It was not something that I was ever going to tell anyone else. And so I didn't have to think about my family at that point of how they were going to feel. It was just about myself. But it was still so, so scary. I mean, do you, do you, do you think people might have said to you if you'd made it clear you were going to meet him, is this a good idea? Should you really do this? Um, yeah, yes, actually, I did ask some people before at a place called Corrie Miller, and there were some people there who said it was far too early in the peace process, and he just come out of prison, and I wasn't ready. And you know, looking back on it, I can see where they're coming from. You know, I now do restorative justice work and restorative processes, where as a facilitator, I do risk assessments all the time, and before I bring people together, and I can, if I put that hat on, I could understand why people said no. You know, and. And yeah, I'm really glad that it happened. I'm glad because it did work. I think it was a risk. You know, there was no support. There was no preparation, um, but it worked. When you first saw him, when you walked into that room and there he was, what did you think? What What was your instant emotional reaction? Well, I was in, in the kitchen and he walked in and... Um, I remember I got up and I shook his hand and thanked him for coming. And um, he said, no, no, thank you for inviting me. And then we talked about how the fact that um, I'd asked several times through different people and whether he would meet me. And I said, have you changed your mind? And he said, no, no, I've always said I'd meet you. And so looking back, that's a bit like an icebreaker because we're both talking about the fact that he said he would meet me. But I always got the no answer. Um, and then we went into our own room at the back of the house, a little conservatory. And I had, I had some strange thoughts. And I mean, I, I'm not someone who thinks any label um, really works, but I had this voice in my head of, he doesn't look like my dear the terrorist. And, and other parts of me going, what are you doing here? You're sitting with a man who killed your father. Go now while you can. But more than that was my need to be present to him, to listen, to dig deeper than what he was saying, because he was arriving with a political hat on. And I knew he would. 
because the, the guys I met in the IRA before had said that that's what he would do, um, that he would come with a sense of righteousness. They were the oppressed. Um, they, there was no other way. And so I was expecting him to, to come with a political voice, which he did. And I didn't argue with him at all. I, I listened and asked him questions. And I actually read a poem to him that I'd written about meeting him. And I think that unnerved him because it was not what he expected. Um, and I remember the point when I when I knew that I got what I wanted from that meeting, that I'd seen that he was someone who cared for his community and he thought very, very deeply, you know, about his decision to join the IRA. Um, and so I'm beginning to see him as a human being and that's what I needed to help me. But he is justifying killing my father and that's hard. So I thought, okay, I'm going to end this now. And just when I thought that, um, he then, he took off his glasses and he rubbed his eye and he said, um, I don't know anymore who I am. Can I hear your anger and your pain? And what can I do for you? And I knew in that moment he'd taken off his political hat and what had just been my need to meet him now became his need. And his voice changed, the tone changed, the language changed. And he began to ask me about my dad, personal questions. And he wanted to know more about the impact on me and my life and what had happened to me. And I could see that he was more vulnerable and open. And it was a very, very different kind of conversation. And, and I did know this was the beginning of a journey, but I did not know where that journey was going to take me. I was just aware. And this was scary as well. You know, this was scary because it was something I had not predicted or expected. I did not have any part of me that, that would think that he would open up. And he has used the words that he was sort of disarmed by my empathy, which are interesting words. And you know, if I'd gone in there going, arguing, going, I'm right, you're wrong, and using history to give the justification for my position then he wouldn't have changed. When he writes in the book that he sensed no hostility at all, and he, he speaks about how you read that poem in that one line in particular, uh, and now I stand alone with you who killed my dad, and you wrote that poem in advance of the meeting. When you read that, was it a sense of, of catharsis? Was it a sense of healing? Was it, you know, what, what for you that moment took that poem, which was so much a beautiful poem, really beautiful poem oh thank you what um, why was that so important to read that so i'm not a poet and i haven't really written a poem since but it it was a way of expressing how i felt um in i think it was in june so a few months before i met him and i wanted him to know what i was feeling and, and why i was meeting him and the idea of um, the idea of bridges, building bridges, have been there since actually since eighty four, and the poem is called "Bridges Can Be Built." And I wanted him to know that also, you know, I acknowledge that his community over the years, the Catholic community, um, what there's been so much suffering, and it's some that's been done in 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 my name, you know, I. It's important to acknowledge the harm that we all cause in terms of individuals, family, communities, governments. Um, and so I just want, I think there's a line in there about I acknowledge, you know, his own suffering, suffering of his people. But the vision of the poem is, is a world where we're all connected through our humanity and, and that the, the pain that we all feel is actually the same, even though we have different outer appearances and different stories. So. So, I mean, looking back on it, I can't really believe that I shared that poem with him, but it seemed really important at the time. I wanted him to read it. At the end of the meeting, I mean, is that when you ever meet anyone, you feel nervous, there's always this sense of how will this end, but this is a, mm. a different sort of meeting altogether. Mm -hmm. So how did you feel about, you know, how is this meeting going to end because this is such a huge moment in your life mm -hmm. so how did you feel about how 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 you know when you get to that moment when you realize it's 
you know, and mm. what did you think to yourself and what did you think about, you know, where, where it would be left at that point? I was so much in the moment and I just knew that I'd reached my limit of being able to listen to him and listen to myself. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't be there anymore, even though I didn't feel finished. Um, and so I said to Patrick, I was going to go. And that's when he said, I'm really sorry I killed your dad. Now, I didn't go for an apology because an apology would not bring my dad back. And what does it mean? But what I did get from that was actually different. For the first time, it was a sense of he's seeing my dad as a human being. And when he planted that bomb, he didn't see you know, anybody in that building. And now he's beginning to humanize my dad. And that's that's very different. And I said to him after that something very strange, which is, I'm so glad it's you. And he didn't know what I meant, nor did I. But when I went back the second time, like three weeks later, I explained it's because of his preparedness to listen to my pain, to see my dad as a human being. And I think that took a lot of courage. For him, it was, it was easier for him before he met me. It's definitely been harder since. And I've been accused of all sorts of things like giving Patrick an easy time. But actually, it's much harder now because he is aware of the impact of what he did. And he's he's chosen to do that. I never told him he had to do that. He chose to, which is much more sort of deep and, and real and lifelong journey. Tell us a bit about, I mean, you've met so many times now. You've got to know each other very well. I mean, did you tell me about how that relationship developed? And were there ever moments where it just seemed too hard? Did you think, you know, this is this is emotionally just too much? Or, or did it, each time, did it become easier? Well, it's, yes, it has been a long journey of like 20 years of different types of interaction. Um, so I'm changed. I'm changing the story. You know, he is still the man who planted the bomb, but he's also the man who's travelled with me to Rwanda, to Palestine, and Israel. We've been to places where he's the only person I know. You know, he's given me support at times when I've needed it. And so a friendship has grown, but it's a very, very unusual friendship. And um, we don't really have words for it in the English language. It's, it's always going to be a different kind of friendship, but I do care about him and I value what I've learned through being in dialogue with him. I also value the amount I've been able to create a positive difference in the world, the amount of understanding I have about violence, about my own violence, even my own need to blame other people. I'm learning about the power of empathy. There's so many things that I've gained as a person. Um, and there are times when I've, I've said, OK, that's it. I need a break. You know, maybe this is it. Um, we've had a few months, uh, maybe a bit longer. We've had some difficult conversations over the years. Sometimes Patrick is needing to move back into the justification a lot more. Um, and other times he's much more fluid about what happened. Like he doesn't know it was the right thing to do. He's He just knows the, the loss that the the pain that he's caused and he's very aware of that so that's the journey that he's in like everyone's healing is is never a straight line you know and it's, it's messy and complex and difficult and so when I meet him and we give our talks which we haven't done for some time and I don't know what's going to happen in the future but we don't prepare it we always speak from whatever is happening at that moment and it depends on who is in the audience so you know I never know what's going to happen and for me, it's about really honouring myself as well. Like I have to take care of myself. So when I've needed a break, that's because it was some, there was something that, you know, I just needed to take time. And perhaps it got too challenging. I can think of sometimes it just did get too challenging. Can I, I mean, you don't have to, but what was there any specific things that you just found too challenging? Well, it would be the justification. And mm -hmm. um, I remember we had a... Um, and this is definitely going to go in my book, so I'm happy to share a bit of it. Now we were um, giving a talk and there was a lot of people in the audience and there was a 
a group had come over from Israel and Palestine called Combatants for Peace, which do incredible work. And um, there was also some people there from North of Ireland, Northern Ireland, and there were other victims of IRA terrorism. So it was an emotionally loaded room. And Patrick got very defensive, which was you know, understandable. And he, and he felt verbally attacked and he moved into complete justification, which is very, very hard for me. And I, I'm always someone who will share. I'll cha I'm happy, to, you know, not happy to challenge, but I will challenge. So I said, this is how I'm feeling right now. When, when you say those words, this is how it leaves me. So we had a sort of difficult conversation. I didn't feel listened to, which is actually very unusual because normally he really, really listens to me, but he didn't have capacity that day. And so after that, we had a few months where we didn't speak. But the good bit is that the Palestinians and Israelis loved it because they were having challenges with, with their dialogue and finding it hard. And they're like, ah, you know, they're finding it difficult. Then that's OK. We're, we're struggling as well. And the truth is, you know, this is emotional work. You know, this isn't like an intellectual exercise. This involves like, every part of us. And so it's absolutely natural that, you know, anyone who's involved in reconciliation or restorative work or working people with different opinions who've hurt us, you know, it's going to require um, a struggle emotionally at times. I mean, from this, you founded Building Bridges for Peace. Do you want to just tell us a bit about that? What's it aiming to do and how much was it so much linked to your own experiences with, with Patrick? Yes, it is linked very much to my experiences with Patrick, but it's also more than that. So my my vision with the charity is to support people in finding other ways um, to resolve conflicts so no one gets hurt. It's to understand the roots of terrorism, roots of violence, roots of war, so that we can address those needs in a non-violent way. Um, and at the beginning, I was just thinking about these islands, but now my you know, my, my thinking is for the for the world. And I do share my story, not for my needs, but where it lands in people and where the conversation goes after that. And I find that people take what they need from the story. And I've been I've listened to so many people open up about their conflict, what, what's happening in their lives and how they want to make a difference. And before in the old days, when you could meet people, I would spend a lot of time in, in Tower Hamlets in London, in the schools there, working with ma mainly the Muslim community uh, and discovered um, from most amazing young people I met how they, they, they are demonized. They feel less than, you know, they receive emotional abuse, regularly verbal abuse um, and how well, one of them, one of the girls said to me, it was the first time that she felt from a white person that she felt listened to and, and valued and heard and that she mattered, which is absolute tragedy that there are people who are experiencing that. You know, I feel I owe it to all, to all of the young people who do feel demonised and, and less than. And, you know, my interest is in a world where that doesn't happen. And a lot of my work is about empowering young people to be positive change makers by giving them support. And actually, they are positive change makers. It's just that no one's given them space to be able to share what their dreams are and believe that they can make them happen. When you, when you meet others who've suffered as a consequence of violent conflict, such as yourself, is there an instant sense of solidarity amongst you, mm -hmm. a shared experience that helps you look at the world in a, in a different way? I think there definitely is. Yeah, one of the things I'm doing now is working um, with survivors against terror, and we've all been affected by by terrorism. And I hear it from others as well. And there is an instant connection. Um, and I remember I had a very special memory of um, of being in Rwanda, which is a very special country, very close to my heart. The people there have been through so much. And I was doing a workshop, and there was an amazing woman who'd gone through so much and I, and I remember in the workshop we had a translator but she put her hand on my leg and she just went for the first time I don't feel alone solidarity and she came from a little village and 
and never met a white person and never knew that people in the world had been through similar things to her. And knowing that her knowing that I cared and that I listened and that you know this was happening was was huge. You know? And I, I have many stories of that of just people and and that's that's a privilege for me and an honor to be able to meet people who've op opened up. And you know when I think about the 27 year old me that wanted to make a difference in the world, you know, I feel like I've only just started, you know, because at the moment, even in the UK, we're just seeing so much of people feeling they're so right that they can then put people down. And it's, it's, we seem to be polarized even more, you know, and I would love to bring, you know, unbounded empathy. And I say unbounded empathy because empathy for me is about that that listening understanding you know all sides even those that represent different views to us you know that is that is emotional work but it's also curiosity it's also letting go a little bit of of being so right and letting go of this this need to tell everyone why we're so right and let's have a different kind of conversation and you know that i think is the heart of building bridges it's how can we have a conversation where you matter just as much as my loved ones because I really believe that when we empathise with other people, we're going to want for them the same we want for our community. What's the one thing that you really want people to learn from your own experiences, from the friendship that you established with the man who killed your father? <sighs> one thing. Well, that whatever people are feeling right now is completely understandable. And it starts... Recovering and, and healing starts with an intention. You know, I'm going to find a way to transform this. Then it's really important to get support and people to listen to you. And those that right now are needing to blame someone, make them wrong, just be a little bit more curious. Just open your heart and just wonder what is their story because they will have a story. We all have our stories. And my, my hope is that. You know, I'm not unique. You know, I'm, I I still have times when I completely want to get angry with people and blame them and can get cross. You know, but I'm learning to have that self awareness that I can change it. I can change that response. After such a long journey, what's the one thing you wish you had at the start that that you have today? I, yeah, I think it's the the knowing that I can give myself support and I can give myself empathy. At, at times I've been very, very hard on myself and I've really learned the importance of self-kindness, self-compassion, self-empathy. And I, that's something that I do with you know, all the people I'm working with is to remind them that when things are tough, that's when we need to be even kinder on ourselves. And so the amount of times I've, at times when I struggle going around London, having not slept with a bad back and I've got a day of talks you know I say to myself I've got my own back I've got this you know I can do this and at times when I've given talks where it's been really really difficult and challenging and someone in the audience has been very cross with me you know then I say to myself you know I'm doing okay and that that self-talk was not something that I had back then and more than ever with the huge challenges we have of mental health and you know we're all going for such a hard time so important to be able to, even when there's no one outside, just to go, I've got this. I'm doing well. I'm doing my best. And that's fine. And that, I, I didn't know that. I didn't grow up with that. I, I really had to learn it. And my daughters have grown up with that. And, I, and I'm so proud of them that they, they know the importance of self-care and how they speak to themselves internally. I have to say, I do think it's scandalous that no publisher has published your a book by you, and I, I, I will personally fight and lobby for that, for that to happen. So any any of them listening or watching, sort it out uh, as soon as possible, because I really think your your insights and you know your your moral lucidity, I think, is something that everyone needs to hear and and, and to and to learn from. I mean, just finally now, how do you just look back at? I mean, it's you know, the Brighton bombing happened almost exactly the same time that I was born. It's a, it's feel, it feels like a, you know, for a new generation younger than me, it seems like a different universe. Mm. 
what do you looking back you know these 36 years losing your father mm. uh, fighting for forgiveness in in the resistance of people who including who were angry and sent you death threats and then meeting and establishing a friendship with the man who killed your father when you look back at all of this with this huge vantage point 20 years since you established that friendship what do you look back what do you most you know with that kind of bird's eye or all that taking a step back what do you most what most strikes you? Hmm. You do ask good question. I I think that you know we all hurt people and we're all hurt. We all carry so much trauma, and I would love an understanding of of emotional intelligence to be there in how we do our politics, you know, and how we create our prison systems, on how we create our schools with much more sense of people are carrying trauma and bring bring empathy into the heart of everything we do. I came from politics, my father was a politician and I would love nothing more than supporting that we do polit politics in a different way. And from that point of empathy and compassion and kindness, spread that out onto how we manage all our relationships and all the institutions. And I think step by step we can do this. There are many, many people who feel like I do. It's incredible work happening. And we all need to keep positive, especially times like this, you know, that we are bringing kindness, we are bringing more awareness of trauma, um, and the world is changing in a positive way, and to keep the hope. Joe, it was a, such an honour to be able to speak to you. Uh, hugely inspirational. And I don't think anyone will be watching this could not be hugely touched and inspired by by your experiences and what you've had to say and i hope people people learn from what you've you've had to say so just thank you so so much for being able to to spend time with me and to be able to talk about this thank you for giving me the opportunity and i love that you called out for someone from my book because that's the next thing i need to do <laughs> we are going to get that book published that's I need, finish, I need to finish writing it as well so well, we can do all of those things. <laughs> uh, but yes, we'll definitely, definitely fight for that to happen. Um, well, thank you so much. Thank you.